Well, let me get to the formal part where I get to introduce Jack. Great. Uh, Dr. Jack Maple is a pediatrician at Boston Medical Center and on faculty at Boston University School of Medicine. And you may also notice that he has several cartoons in his pre presentation, and he is a prolific cartoonist along with a fabulous conversationalist. Oh Take it away, Jack. <laughs> Well, thank you for the chance to be here, Chris and Gentry as well, and and for the folks who are who are here, and then for those who will be joining us, uh, we get to sort of exploit the intimacy of just having a smaller crew. So do use the chat if you have questions or comments. Like, wow, those glasses look like they're from Walgreens, and you would totally be right. Um, but um, I think what uh, we can do here is maybe Gentry, if you could put up the slides, we can jump in to some um, some visuals here that I think will. Uh, get us started and I think um, are by no means like the last word, but I think I might think of them as the first word and what might kick off a conversation here <clears throat> this evening where we can talk and take your questions and um, I look forward to some interactions and uh, we'll absolutely tell you what I know and we'll absolutely admit when I don't know. And I'll ask uh, from Chris or those on on the production side if we can get copies of these slides if people are interested. There are some links at the end that people might find useful. Okay, so this this is um, <laughs> this is a slide that reminds us that there's a pandemic, just in case we'd forgotten in the last two minutes. Uh, I am once again Jack Maple. I, I work with Boston University School of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics at Boston Medical Center. I'm a primary care doc. I mostly take care of kids with chronic and complex illness, but I take care of kids of all ages uh, and of families from a very diverse um, set of communities around Metro Boston and Eastern Massachusetts. I think. Um, that gives me a perspective from uh, both a pediatric point of view, also as a parent. I have three kids, ages, ages span 12 to 21. So we'll talk a little bit about today, some of about sort of surviving this pandemic we're in, um, thinking about some common scenarios and what where the challenges might be. Uh, and then we can jump in terms of what's, uh, what's reasonable in terms of what we might expect of ourselves and our kids and maybe some hacks or ideas uh, or checklisty sorts of tasks we can assign ourselves and our families to prepare for those kinds of outings and expeditions, uh, and then coming back home. And then um, I, I want to just really sound, um, you know, and, and expand the communication around the, the necessity for people not to disconnect from their medical home where they get their kids' primary care or where they themselves get their primary care so they can get their health attended to, but not just medical, also behavioral and dental health. So, you know, this, these are new times and uh, it comes with new challenges and um, even things like snow days that were fun in past in past years during the winter um, propose different kinds of annoyances now. So I think everyone's we're all uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a slide from which a graphic for which I did for um, we're calling layer the cheese. Um, and it really was designed for um, a series of recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics caring for kids with complex and chronic illness. So that could be kids with autism or cerebral palsy or asthma or diabetes, but actually, actually it applies to everybody. And so think of protection uh, of layers of Swiss cheese as by themselves, but as like one layer of cheese is pretty good. Like staying six feet or more apart is pretty good by itself. It's a great start in terms of, of distancing and, and giving ourselves uh, some protection, but there are, it's not perfect, right? It's like there are plumes in our sneezes and our coughs or our utterances. If I make a point that might aerosolize and spread something a little extra farther. So some of those viral particles can get through. But if I do, if I am distancing and I wear a mask and additively, if I am washing my hands and I'm doing other things like relentlessly cleaning surfaces or other things we'll talk about, like, like not congregating in crowds, then I can have what we might think of as like additive layered protection, creating a zone of safety around my kid, myself, my family. And when people do this together or additively or at the same time, it actually layers in extra protection in society. So we layer those layers of cheese and we just make ourselves hungry as we do that. So let's talk about like the play date. So maybe before you call up or if you're if your four year old or 10 year old or three year old, you know, really wants to see their friends, you have to sort of say for all of these approaches, every for all of our questions, we all come to these conversations as uh, people in a, in a matrix of circumstances. So my household is not your household. So I can't sit here and pontificate or 
tell you what to do because it depends a bit on, do you live in a high rise uh, building? Do you live in a condo? Do you live in a farm? Do you live in a semi-rural or suburban area? Do you do or do not have space? Do you have family that live nearby or you're like transplants and you live far away from your supports? So all those things actually add up. And so, you know, behind these little vignettes we'll talk about, let's say it's a, it, you have a five-year-old who really, really wants to see their best friend who's in their Zoom class. And so you're gonna do that. Now, you may have an arrangement where you have decided or committed to pod with a family or quarantine, right? Where you, you or a, a small number of families sort of agree to sort of be like planets in orbit of each other, limiting contagion, but just kind of saying, I can drop my kids off at your house. You can drop them off at my house. We're all going to sort of observe the same standards and we're going to try to limit contacts outside of this larger peer or family group. Now I can tell you fundamentally, the more people you add to that group, the greater the risk that they might have a point of contact uh, with someone on the outside. So it's not, a, it's not a zero proposition, but all these things are, we're gonna talk about risk and benefit sort of analysis throughout this, this chat today. Like, so is it, is, is you are gonna be more sane if you can partner with another household who is like-minded with you and your partner, and they are going to help watch kids and you all have the same kind of sense of like masking and reinforcing things and bedtime and whatever those things are. You're, it's never going to be perfect. You have to give a little control to get something back. But if you're talking about a play date with someone in your pod, easy peasy, that should be pretty clear from terms you've agreed upon. If it's a family that's outside your group, um, then it's it's a little different, right? So you might, if you let's go back to that five-year-old. If you're going to have a, a play date, where's it going to be? Well, we know from, from science and from research, it's going to be safer if it's outside. It's going to be better for everybody and the adults, the adult play date chaperones. I'm sorry, the, it's not a, well, it could be an adult play date, but the kid play date um, chaperone by the adults is going to go over better or it's going to be safer if it can be at an outside location. So a playground, a park, uh, a field, a meadow, uh, maybe someone's backyard, uh, maybe around um, on the deck or the patio. And so in that sense, kids can uh, set up um, blankets. Kids could set up games. They could do things where, um, if they're you know not necessarily frequently in contact you might be able to negotiate that inter internal to yourself or in tandem with the family um that that kids over two can wear masks and that you really are you know one thing that might be helpful at this time of year now that school has started or a lot of kids have gone back to school you might say hey listen guess what school rules are now home rules and we all have to be careful we all have to wash our hands before we begin we all have to wear our masks and we all have to really limit our contact with each other. And I think put it into that, make it, this is, this is life now. And chances are they will adapt far faster than we will as adults. They are far more resilient and far more adaptable than we fogies who are like over the age of 18. Um, kids just can accept this as normal, but it will require that we don't just sort of turn them loose and go back to our conversation, but rather you probably will need in the first few outings to really coach and help. Uh, much like teachers and teachers aides will do in a classroom environment. So in these play dates in 2020 autumn, we have to help our kids learn how to renegotiate and understand the rules of play, much like if they're going onto a soccer field, like you can't use your hands. And now here in the world of social distancing and COVID, we have to observe things like social distancing, hygiene, wearing masks, and then washing our hands after, after um, maybe doing activities together. And I'm saying all this, and there are probably some people here who's, blood pressure just went over 200 over 120 because they're like, there's just no way I can do that. Like, nah, I got a sick spouse at home who's on chemo, or I have a, I have a live at home elder who has multiple issues. I can't do that. And I say, okay. So it doesn't mean you're the Grinch. It just means that's your reality. And this, and is horrible this tough year of 2020, we all have to look fundamentally on what our, what our terms are and what our, what the risks are and what the variables are. So again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just sort of saying, these are the frames you have to think about it. And if you can't commit to certain elements of that, or if you're seeing that perhaps the family you're working with is playing loosey goosey or is just not interested, then maybe that's not a family you hang out with. And maybe that's a family you have, you have to sort of teleconference with a little longer. And chances are, this is gonna be our world for a while, but more on that later. Questions on the chat. Very appropriate because in the, this particular corner of my house, I can hear crickets. So it just sort of fills the space here. It's perfect. 
But if you do have questions, I'm, I'm all yours. Chris, did you have any questions for me? No, I just think it's really good to reiterate that um, everybody has a different tolerance in terms of the risk that they can take. And the more judgment we can take out of it, yeah. the better we'll all be able to get along with one another. Yeah, I kind of get I kind of get rolling here. So if I'm if I'm getting a little frothy or if I'm getting a little quick, you can slow me down or um, don't hesitate to bookmark me here. So um, we are now kind of just shifting the frame and I'm going to talk a little more about ways you can pr prep kids for school. I'm just going to say this. Um, this is not a newsflash. We're all scared. We're all swimming in this milieu of like uncertainty and changing situations and, and updated facts and misinformation and and, um, and then updates that might conflict with something at 12 o'clock that you had heard previously at nine o'clock. So th this is a lot. We're all under a lot of stress. And kids have, as my uh, professor said, have the biggest bull bullshit detectors uh, and the biggest um, sort of uh, radar dishes on their heads. You just can't see them. So if you're stressed, they're picking up on it. You, we, all, we all send out these cues. So they're watching us. They're watching us try to figure this out. And going back to school or back to daycare or sort of a preschool situation, absolutely is is they're they're looking to us for like, is this okay? And so one of the things we have to do, kind of like a like when I was an intern running to a sick patient's room, the first thing we we're we we're sort of counseled to do in some famous um, some famous readings were given is the first thing you do in a situ in a crisis situation is take your own pulse, like take a breath, collect yourself. And when you're trying to be talking about something for um, about going back to school or about going to school for your kids, you know, the idea here is to sell it. You have to if, if we need them to do it, then we have to let them know that we believe in it. Even if in our heart we have our doubts, we have to project confidence for them. Um, now, if they're if you're pulling them out of school and you're doing something different, that's a different situation. But as our kids are returning to school or as many have been back to school, we have to be supportive of the idea of school so that they realize we're not giving them an out. Like, well, you don't think it's important, so I'm not doing it. I'm not I'm not logging on because you you think it's baloney. Um, and I think we have to also um, prepare them if they haven't really dived into the academics yet, if there's been sort of a slow kind of like sort of re-entry into the academics and the work of the work, then I think it's helping kids understand how, yeah, this is actually school, but it's different now. Like you saw something in the spring, perhaps if you were eight, old enough to go, or now it's, 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 it's different. It's a new year. It's a new grade. It's a new situation. Some of this will be fun for you and familiar. Other things will be, will be, um, will be different. And they're going to have questions. And I think, I think it's fine. I think it's absolutely important. We just let them know, like, I don't know, like if there's a question we don't know the answer to, like, well, I see the principal every day. Like, well, well, I have homework. Like some of that stuff, you may have gotten a thousand emails. You might even have read 1% of them, not me. But, but I think the idea here is they'll be honest, do your homework, you know, pledge to, you know, commit to learning and finding out what you can and, and then commit to getting back to them because no one, like they'll remember that they asked you about something. And so we owe them that. Um, and then as they, as they re-engage into, as school becomes more intense, it's, it's October now. Um, and even, even set, uh, districts that started late are really starting to dig into the first units of learning with even with some evaluation, expect some backsliding. Like there may have been a little bit of a honeymoon as they're like, I'm back. It's my friends. This summer's not boring anymore. Or I'm just, I'm doing what I like to do, or at least some of it's fun but they may still struggle with this whole online thing. Some kids I think really are taking off. I think others are, uh, and in particular, I find the kids who are anxious and introverted, this is their day. Like they are cleaning up. And the kids who are extroverted, who love like to be in person and to like work the room, I think some of them are really struggling. Um, some kids are resilient and you can throw anything at them and it'll just take it. Um, but, um, I also see that some kids who have learning issues who might be um, not well served by the screens that, that they're presented with. And so screen based learning for some kids really does not necessarily allow them to achieve what, you know, what might otherwise be offered in an in person environment. If they have an individual education plan and they get occupational therapy or physical therapy or speech and language or reading support or pull out time or tutoring, like doing that on Zoom. I mean, I don't know about you guys. My butt is so flat. Like they are probably as tired of it as I am. And that in itself can be, you know, while it's a tremendous tool and allows us to keep things in flight, 
it's not the same and does not for the same rewards. So we're all learning collaboratively and together and about the same time how to do this better. We've never done it before. Chris, comments or questions? Because the chat still, I can hear the crickets outside. Crickets I can't see outside. the comments in the chat. Yeah, so far it's pretty quiet. I think everyone's listening. Okay. Everyone's listening and laughing. Because Stunned silence. Okay. That's well, flat butts. That's what we all have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So what is it? Um, Homo zoomicus, I think is the new, um, <laughs> it's going to be the new anthropological term for all of us. <laughs> okay. So here, you know, and then there's the, the idea of like, there's not just the compartments of your life in like play and community um, and school, but there's also what um, people in like the health space might call ADLs or activities of daily living. So that's like um, going about and um, doing the things you need to do in your life maintenance, right? Like running your errands. Um, for kids, it's going to be participating in athletics or community-based experiences, like including things at church or doing educational or developmental or enrichment activities. Um, kids uh, doing stuff with their peer groups, including things like birthday parties. Oh my God, birthday parties. Actually, I haven't missed those, but that's just me. Um, Don't and then... spit on the cake. Don't spit on the cake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Blow out the candles and hock a loogie. Um, and then reconnecting, as I said before, in all seriousness with um, care providers, and that can be health, uh, dental, or behavioral. Uh, and I think some folks have been very successful at pivoting over to telehealth and keeping up a connection when uh, either distance or barriers of transportation or concern for contagion have uh, interrupted their ability to get to, to visits. I think telehealth is not going away. I know the West Coast is way ahead of us out here on the East Coast uh, in terms of adopting and integrating telehealth into your into your health care. Um, you know, out here, it, it feels a little bit like we discovered fire. You know, it, it, it definitely allowed us to uh, relaunch uh, aspects of our practice that have been a boon to families and have re has really been delightful. Um, but we also appreciate that coming in for a visit has its place. And sometimes there's you really can't replace um, a televisit with one and seeing somebody or listening to a chest or looking at a, at a particularly curious or unusual sort of finding that really requires, or talking about a delicate matter that is just better in person. So you have to think if you're looking at, um, you know, running to get your the oil changed in your car or going to the pharmacy or taking your kids along as you go, you have to consider the extent where everyone in the, in the um, away party is gonna be congregating or subject to lines, like trying to get into Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or someplace, uh, and that uh, not just you, that, that, that everyone understands before you leave the property that everyone's going to mask who is two and older who can. Uh, recognizing, as an aside, some people can't for a variety of reasons. No one wants to. Every, it's a must do for everyone who otherwise can. And so that's just not negotiable. So if you can't, then maybe we have to like have you stay home or you have to stay with um, your partner or other caretaker or uh, you have to, we have to, we have to, we have to work on this and rehearse it. And for littler kids, um, just to be a little all over the place. Um, uh, in the later part of the summer, we had a lot of discussions with families who essentially did like dress rehearsals, you know, so that for them, it was rehearsing to wear a mask for a morning, starting with it for an hour, then getting up to a few hours uh, before they went to school. And so if you have kids who really haven't been out of the house much or out of the family compound and haven't been out into the community to go to the bakery or whatever else it is you do, uh, you might need to do such dress rehearsals. and. Praise them for their success. Be patient because they'll mess it up, and they're kids. So we have to we have to be um, supportive, and then we also have to in, enforce those limits. But you know, again, you know, here in my state, um, folks tend to be mostly pretty uh, adherent in terms of uh, showing up and wearing their masks when they're in a public place. Not so much on sidewalks, walking their dog, but definitely if they're going to places of commerce or of gatherings. Um, and there's going to be more pressure now that the temperature is dropping outside and we're going to have to see that's a work in progress. We're going to have to see how that goes. I'm seeing in uh, the chat, another mom was aghast when she was kicked out of a store because her infant didn't have a mask on, even though the rest of the family was. So that's just tragic. I think that just speaks to me a lack of understanding that, you know, the American Academy of Pa Pediatrics, the American um, Academy of Family Medicine and others, it, it's recognized that it actually isn't safe for kids under two to wear face masks. Now, you might, if you have a kid in a car seat, like a baby, you might put a blanket or something over, over a car seat or infant carrier if you're, if you're using it, but no, it's we're not expecting nor asking for 
children under the age of 24 months to wear face masks. Questions Thank you for comments? clarifying that. Of because course. I think that was a huge discussion at the time, I remember. And a lot yeah. of people just didn't know that that's the rule. Yeah, people often get angry before they fact check. And that can um, completely distract us from like, a, a construct, um, you know, um, thoughtful neighborly solutions to these kinds of problems. Exactly. So this kind of goes to, um, you know, I really wrote this, you know, being mindful of uh, thinking about the kids, but sometimes I think we could, we could also apply these things to ourselves uh, in terms of our engaging in work or um, group care uh, outside the home. So as kids are readapting to whatever your new normal is, um, and it will, again, be framed by who you are and where you are, you know, look for changes, that the, the, the nonverbal things, because kids can't say, uh, mom and dad, I'm feeling rather stressed by the background and uh, somewhat traumatizing nature of the news. And I, I can't really process this information. So I'm going to manifest this in a variety of symptoms that uh, like, I'm going to tell you my stomach hurts or that I can't poop or I can't go to sleep. And that's really how kids, you know, it's, pediatrics is sometimes veterinary in terms of how we have to read our patients. They can't say it. So we have to watch, listen, and parents and caretakers of kids are our champions and you are the experts in your children. So if you're seeing something that really is different, it probably is. And I think of that as like parental or caretaking spider sense. So I really, really think that um, if you're worried, um, you know, check yourself. And if it just seems to be out of the normal, touch base with your, your kiddo's um, primary care provider, because there may be something going on there and you, you'll benefit from some reassurance or you may benefit from getting something triaged to be evaluated. Um, and so that could be things that are out of character. So kids who are more moody, kids who just get demotivated or just kind of get um, their, their passions and their sense of fun seems to have like left town. And that, that may be a, a sign that they're feeling um, sad, stressed, freaked out or shut down. Um, other kids act out differently and it might be, they may be fine. They may be fine. They may be fine. And then they have an out of scope kind of eruption around some transaction or interaction with a, with a peer or sibling. And it just is like, you're thinking to yourself in those moments, like, okay, you know, it, they're just Legos. Um, I don't know that you had to break the iPad. Like, and I've, um, if I were a funeral director for iPads, this, in the last quarter, um, I would be doing a booming business. I think kids are, they're so frustrated. They even take out, take it out on their beloved technology because it, all this overflow grief or, or redirected stress um, goes onto the things that are before them. Uh, you might see teariness and out of uh, that just sort of like, again, sort of, it seems to flip out of nowhere. And so the best thing you can do is be patient with them. And you don't have to check in every 15 minutes because I'll tell you it's annoying. Mom, I'm fine. But just let them talk. I find the best places for that to happen are driving around. Maybe I'm on to one of those errands we were talking about. Kids just may come out with the fact that they're worried about grandma or they're worried that they're going to die if they go to uh, Publix and into the grocery store. Um, you just never know. And usually I find the actual thought is like a submarine. It dives down and then kind of comes up on a moonlit night in the middle of your day. And then there you are, and there it is. And see what they say. I, I just wanna reiterate one thing you said, Jack, which was, it's not just the kids who are having all of those symptoms. Yeah, we're all feeling it. I completely agree. Yeah, and I think the adults around me are having meltdowns a lot more often than we used to. And it's important to just recognize that that's part of your stress process too. I can't even believe you said that. No, I completely agree. Um, that is, uh, in all seriousness, like I have found myself, uh, I, I live in Massachusetts, the um, Commonwealth with the worst drivers in the country. And I had, I have felt myself over the last several months. Um, I'm already like an angry driver because I live here, but it just feels like, whoa, why am I laying on the horn when that person just was changing lanes without their blinker, like let it go. And I find I have to listen to what I'm talking about here and check check myself. Uh, and I think we all have to do that at some point because it just how can you how can you exist um, in this in this moment without being impacted by it? I would actually worry about us if we weren't feeling something or reacting in such a way. So the fact that that might then come back to our kids or that they may pick up on it and then internalize it is something we have to just admit to ourselves 
and then be prepared or at least do our best to try to, to, um, to manage. Uh, and in that sense, we try to model the comm to the best extent that we can. Uh, and I think, you know, it, sometimes um, you, you do routines if you can do routines. And, and I think for some people, every day is like improv theater. So you, you have to do that. I'm not, I'm not sitting here. Oh my here. God. Yes. So much. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, give me, give me a, give me a food, give me a location, give me a, a vibe I'm feeling right now. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, um, we have to, like, I, I, I tweet a lot. And one of the, my favorite hashtags is be kind because you don't know what sort of terrible difficulty someone might just be coming from because their kids struggling or they have a sick relative or their resources are overextended and stretched. And you know, all of those things are true for too many people right now. It's not a political statement. It's just a fact. So I think it means we as citizens and as neighbors have to do our best to um, try to be generous and thoughtful and empathetic. Um, and so there might be for your younger kids, for your preschoolers, sitting down with some books like Llama Llama, Mrs. Mama, or other titles that you even just like comfort food that you love together, sitting down and just doing something that's not about the news and it isn't even about school, but just having downtime on a get a beanbag chair and chill the heck out. Um, for little kids, it might be recreating or modeling routines at school. So if they love the water table, then that's what that's what dishwashing becomes. Or uh, maybe um, doing some art, getting some art supplies, getting some clay, getting some paper if you can, uh, and just doing some art and make the fridge the gallery and go nuts because that just might be, you know, creativity works for me in healthcare is one of my outlets. I think kids have shown me how that's how they process things. And I think we can learn from them. And I think t our teen and tween patients are having a hard time. I, I'll say I'll say it briefly, and if people want to hear more, we can talk about it. But you know, certainly I can say in our large 14,000 um, member uh, pediatric uh, practice, we have seen some of the most um, uh, challenging cases and most distressed kids and young adults to be those who are you know of of um, maybe 12 and up because they're feeling uh, isolated. They're in, they're generally speaking, extremely social beings and everything about the pandemic has shut down or cut off them from what they might regard as their lifeblood. And so some of them have, um, so the double whammy is less access to the services or supports that they got at school. And so if they're remote learning at home, it's not the same or they don't wanna engage or they can engage. And so I think um, if you have that tingling spider sense about your teen or tween, take it very seriously. You know, so ideally, you know, we, we imagine maybe back in um, <laughs> March that homeschooling was going to look like this, you know, it was going to be like a nice well-lit place with a, with an awesome Wi-Fi connection, um, a pandemic puppy at your feet while you connect with friends at school. And I think for some people that's true. I'm seeing a question here. Uh, my daughter turned one and is scheduled to have her shots this week. Is staying on schedule with vaccinations an acceptable risk? My answer to that is yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially because those are those typically 12 month vaccines are ones she has not gotten yet. So anything you can do, including a flu shot to expand and deepen her protection against infectious disease is absolutely vital and important. I totally agree with Chris. That was a great question. I would almost think about it as a plant, but I appreciate the sincerity and authenticity of that. Thank you. I, I'm glad for being asked. Uh, anyone else disconnected or is it doctor? Uh-oh. I think maybe they mean they can't see you. Oh, no. I can see me. Okay. Oh, she's gonna she's log, gonna out, and log out and come back in. Okay. All right, Lindsay, we look forward to seeing you again. Okay, uh, so I think, um, and then last comment on these slides before we maybe jump over into a dialogue is, I, I ask parents like, listen, a lot of folks don't, don't read anymore. Um, and a lot of folks will, am I frozen? I'm getting a frozen chat here. I, I can see you okay, it's working okay for me. Okay, maybe it's a movie reference, but um, uh, I think, um, 
you know, so for parents who are learners, I just sort of say like, here are just a couple of online ones because a lot of folks don't want to dump into the American Academy of Pediatrics or the CDC. So you can look on YouTube at these at these um, websites, which might be helpful. Uh, Common Sense Media has some great resources. The AAP uh, is a great place to go. Uh, and then YouTube videos, um, they have some great stuff and they have some lousy stuff. So you might want to talk to uh, other parents or your primary care provider for some recommendations there. I see uh, Lindsay's question, are County in California's reopening playgrounds over the next few weeks? Thoughts or guidance on this? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and that was, a, that was a hot one here out east, like around um, May and June, when, when weather was finally warming up and uh, families were venturing back to reopen basketball courts and playgrounds and um, play structures. So yeah, I think it's, it's um, I think you should go. I think, and there's ways you can do it. Like in all these things, you're gonna become an expert as to like, don't go at peak times. Like I wouldn't go to, I wouldn't go to McDonald's at uh, for takeout at, at noon. I would go at like 10 or I would go at three. You, you go to the playground, not at peak time, like after nine or even 11 a.m. You might go early in the morning as a part of your early routine or at the, end of the day, like around dinner time, when folks are, are back home eating, maybe you got to sneak out and get some playground time because there'll just be less congregation and less likelihood of spread. I think you can wash, have your child wash their hands before they go, and you can have your child wash their hands before they return home. And I think when you get home, you leave your shoes by the door and that's where they live. And we all, we all learn from our Asian um, friends and neighbors who, you know, it's a longstanding tradition uh, to, um, uh, leave your shoes at the door and go barefoot to the home to avoid tracking the viral particles inside. We have similar strategies around the grocery store. We went today and it was so, my husband went, it was so crowded. He was like, no, we have to go during the day. Yeah, go to Costco like on Monday night, right? You don't go to Costco on Saturday morning, uh, speaking from hard experience because like long, annoying lines, but also tons of people and, and those prolonged sort of interludes of being congregated with people raises your risk. Uh, question from someone else. Is it safe to travel on a plane with a toddler? Okay, so I'm going to answer this a couple of different ways. So let's pretend you were thinking about a trip first and you didn't already have it in your hand. Um, uh, because sometimes you have to travel by plane. If, someone's, if it's a long trip or, it's, um, or there's an urgent sort of time frame issue, plane is the way you have to go. That's what you do. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you're mulling away of like, if I wanted to go visit a friend, I live in Massachusetts, I wanted to see someone in New York or Washington, D.C. Historically, I could hop a shuttle from the airport and get there in no time flat. Now I am more likely to drive my car or to explore other ways where I'm going to be less sort of cooped up in the common spaces of airports and in an airplane. That's if I have a choice and I may not have a choice. So if you are traveling with a, an infant or toddler, there are better and worse ways to, to travel by air. Uh, and people do it. So first of all, if you're if you're um, browsing airlines and fares, you might uh, sort of do do your reading and intelligencing online and find out like what are the what's the airline's commitment to social distancing and spacing on the planes? Are they booking the planes and filling all the seats? That would not be my first choice. Uh, if they are booking uh, and leaving the middle seats open, that would be preferred. But for example, now if you have a toddler who's I'm going to presume under two then they, they should not be expected to wear a mask. And you can cover your bases because there's, you, could, you could consider if you, if you need to, or you should, could call the airline and ask in advance, um, depending on your child's age and your insight to your, to your child. Like if they won't wear a mask, what are your options? There have been um, somewhat dramatic headlines um, of uh, families who were turned away or who were not allowed to, to engage in a flight for like a two-year-old because they couldn't keep their mask on. Uh, and that just seems tragic and unfair. Uh, if you are committed to going on the flight and you've, you are either like locked into your fare or you found the airline that sort of, sort of fits your safety profile, then you, can, you might ask to um, sit um, in a seat um, either at the front or the back of the plane if that's to your advantage or if that's, if that's okay. Um, and then alternatively, uh, or I'm sorry, additionally, I would say for any outing you're doing, any expedition, like of a, you know, for a day trip or for a multi-day trip, prepare like hell. Bring BYO everything. Bring your gloves, bring your hand sanitizer, bring your, um, bring your snacks, 
uh, and you might have to purchase some of these things in the um, in the airport. I rec I, I realize, but you want to be over prepared so that so that you're not with doing without, and so you don't have to rely on shared materials while you're in flight or in in transit. Um, Why and then, sitting at the front or the back? Just out of curiosity. Sorry. Why sitting at the front or the back? Uh, usually, well, sitting in the front might be you can get on and off more quickly, perhaps. Um, sitting in the back, uh, not always, but usually there are fewer people in a in a un, in a less booked plane, and planes have been less booked. You might just have more acreage of unused, unoccupied seats in the back of the plane. If I it's see. a if it's a booked flight, doesn't really matter. I see. It's a good question. Additional thoughts or comments. Um, I'll just comment real quick. My family just traveled cross country and we actually chose to do, um, uh, we have a, a trailer. So we just camped our way across the country Yeah, and had really minimal contact and it was all outside and it, it felt mostly safe. I have to say that to your comment earlier about Massachusetts, most people are good about wearing their masks. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I saw it being very uneven. Yeah. Across the country. Yeah. So some uh, places. Yeah. Right. So went for went for a um, visiting some some folks in Connecticut uh, on a particular day and there just was less um, adherence to masks that day. And maybe they were better the next day. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, and you're right, Chris, I think we've seen an uptick in things like RV rentals and um, people vacationing at home or doing Airbnbs, all those things. Um, it just totally changes um, our frame for travel. Yeah, that's that was a big question on my mind for the past several weeks. But if you have a sick parent, for example, who lives in another state, you got to go. And okay. if you don't have someone to leave your kid with, they got to go with you. So you do it and you just prepare like hell. And there's some good articles about this. And I do have some links in the slides at the end that um, hopefully folks can share if that's okay. Yeah, and we'll have those. Uh, typed up in some way to share with people after, so they have the resources. Great. Um, another question that came in was talking about birthday parties. Uh, sure. And, you know, even like I, I can, this is a general question, like our birthday party safe, but I know my own example was a dear friend of mine, her birthday came up and it was just her and her son and we know them and we feel comfortable with them. We were like, yeah, come on over. We'll have it in the backyard. It'll be fine. But on that day, there was so much smoke. We couldn't go oh, outside. We yeah. couldn't breathe. So I set it up in the garage where I shoved them in a corner of the garage with like a, a table. And I measured 10 feet to another table. So my family sat at the other end and they sat at these. Yep. <laughs> like I made her sit in a corner in my garage for her birthday. But that was the best I felt I could do. And I felt like a paranoid crazy person. So if you're in a situation where you really want to connect with someone, is there a way to do it safely indoors? Like, is it 10 feet? Is it eight feet, six feet? Do you need masks? What if you're eating? What if you're drinking? Yeah. A um, couple of couple thoughts on that. So first of all, um, you know, six feet is, I think is an agreed upon number. It's, it's, um, we're going to learn more about this in the next couple of years, you know, schools and in, in some instances, I think in part like negotiation and politic and got that number down to three feet in some, in some situations I, I've, I've um, reviewed. And uh, I don't think anyone was terribly impressed by that low, low a number. You know, we have seen, and I'm sure folks have read articles or seen videos on like the plumes where like when someone sneezes can travel up to 12, the virus can travel up to say 12 feet. So six feet is half of that. Right. So, um, but it, it, we're layering the, we're layering the cheese, right? So, so six feet is a good start. Six feet with a mask is a better start. Six feet with a mask, someone who might be sick, that you limit your time to under 15 minutes is, is relatively low risk. Time over 15 minutes correlates with a, a, a rapidly rising rate of infection in a closed space. If you're outside and there's, and there's a prevailing breeze, that lowers your risk again. There's another cheese layer for you. So it really depends. You have to look at a scenario and make the best of it. I just want to say, cheers to you. Like you are making lemonade with those lemons, right? You have a garage and um, 
bad air outside and a kid who is probably feeling a little uh, ripped off that they're not getting the birth that, that they expected. We're not the seniors in high school and college aren't getting the, like their fourth year that they deserve or wanted. Everything's upended. So as Chris Rock said on Saturday Night Live, all of our plans are canceled and, and just like disrupted. And so, yeah, little, we have to and a little bit of like heartbreak and empathy for these kids. Not a pity party. Like we got to like, yeah, it really stinks. But you know what? Let's let's make the best of this we can, because that's what we have to do. And, and we have to do that for a while. And it, it gets old. I think we're all sick of it. But this is our life now. When you say a while, can you expand on that from your medical perspective? Sure. I think um, I think we're going to be living in this kind of like. Uh, I don't think we're going to have, I don't believe from what I've been reading and hearing that we're going to enter the shutdown um totality of last spring, I think it's likely we're going to have versions of this that may be local. There might be like regions or municipalities that that hunker down or shut down certain things or limit bars or restaurants, for example, first. And um, schools may go in and out of uh, in and out of uh, in-person learning, at least for this academic year. And I think following the cues of large corporations, which are essentially like not inviting whole workforces back into their offices tell us that there's being a there's a it's a recognition that entrenching for like this kind of life for at least eight more months is likely there's a small possibility it'll be 12 months um we all hope i hope i'm wrong well i've heard longer estimates too yeah people have said up to 2022 um but that's you know i can give you the weather forecast for next summer but that's that's what it is there's an, like a physician's almanac. <laughs> yes, Ben Franklin did it. Yep. <laughs> still accurate. Still accurate. Aging Dr. Franklin. Yes. Uh, okay. If there are any other questions, we have just a couple more minutes. And also, if you think of a question later, just send it to us. We can we can answer it later. It's okay. Sure. If you don't do it right now. Yeah. Um, and I have one more question for you, Jack. In your experience as a pediatrician, what's the most common question that you get from parents? Do I have to come in? Is probably the most is the first is the most common question, and sometimes the answer is no. No, you really don't. Like we can look at a we can look at an eczema rash, you know, over the over video, and there's a lot, and we can even look at a mouth and look at some tonsils. We can watch a baby breathe. We can look at boogery noses. Um, like there's lots we can do. Um, so that's. Um, I think the most common one, I would say. And then after that is, and if I do come in, is it safe? And um, I would say that generally speaking, going to a medical, going to a medical visit um, by, if you attend a well-run practice and most are, um, it's probably as safe or safer than going to some other businesses, frankly. So, because of all the precautions we do and we are relentlessly cleaning and and all high touch surfaces get washed down before the next person enters. Uh, that's in my interest. It's in your interest. So we 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 got to we have to keep working there, and we want it to be safe for you so that you can come there. So I think we want to, people to feel confident about getting their care. I have to say, I had a, a fever like, like a month ago, six hmm. weeks ago, and I had to go in and get tested for COVID. Yeah. And I remember being very scared of going in. Sure. And I it was the safest I have felt since the pandemic started, just in terms of how they handled it and all yeah. the precautions they took. I I was pleasantly surprised by yeah. how easy and safe it was. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's startling how I've gotten used to wearing a mask eight hours a day. You know, haven't passed out, haven't, um, you know, I'm, I um, haven't gotten my, my, ma- my mask knee yet, but uh, I know people who complain about it. Okay, well, we should have another webinar on mask me. Deal. <laughs> and other dermatological wonders of the pandemic, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, is there anything else that you would like to say as we wrap up? Anything you wanna have parents just walk away with really strongly? Yeah, I, I think as a, as a pediatric provider, I will just say, you guys are my heroes. You know, you're, you're showing up and doing it every day. It's hard, it's lonely, it can be um, scary. Um, but you have to understand that like your love matters, your dedication matters. It all counts and don't be too hard on yourselves. Don't beat yourself up. It's, if you think it's easy, (laughs) you're the only one. Um, but I do, but I do think that, um, you know, people like myself 
uh, I'm like part of a symphony of people who are here to support you, um, be they on the community side, in the medical side or wherever. And we want you to be successful and to know that you're not alone. So hopefully sessions like this can be helpful. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jack Maple, for joining us today. Pleasure and like mine. I said, any more questions you guys have, feel free to send them on in. And I look forward to it. We will see you again sometime very soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Be safe. Wash your hands if you have them. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> right. bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.